Hello and welcome back to another episode of Gint Oxide. Yes, pressing the record combination also triggers going to Hacker News and Safari. That's always fun. Welcome back, Sydney. Always a surprise. Hi. <laughs> and um, yeah, we of course still do something related to short IDs. And I think last time we once again worked on uh, the prefix, which allows us to yeah, just know how many bytes and half bytes of an ID we actually want to participate in the prefix lookup. And in Git, uh, it's always great fun to see them describe something that has a length, but it's actually length in hexadecimal characters. And, you know, the prefix kind of embeds both together and makes that very, very clear what that is supposed to be. So no more confusion, hopefully. And I think last time we left with this code a little bit different because I, I looked at it and thought, mm, why not go all the way in? Because previously it was more like was more like this in the sense of it was like this, it was this. And I didn't like the returns here, you know? That's all. Just, you know, it was a bit my eye didn't like it so much. And I thought, can this be different? And then I thought, yes, why not? And that resulted in this refactor here. Funny. I would have done it, yeah, like I would have kept it this way because I usually don't like the nesting so much. <laughs> so I, I usually try to prefer the return route, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, you know, to me, it feels safe to be in one of these um, braces and these scopes. To me, that feels safer mm -hmm. somehow because I, I know where I am. Uh, somehow that's how it feels and I get that huh? it's you know just imagine this was a match but a match wouldn't be as practical here um, but it could be a match and then it feels even kind of more natural to the rust, rusty eye I guess so over time that that happens so these returns but I can imagine also you know why it was like it was before uh, with the explicit returns which also makes sense and is kind of you know, I thought about an alternative now that we are with refactoring here. Um, it's more like, can this be some block that actually has a return value and only, only if everything is good, then we actually provide the hex thing. Otherwise we have an early return here. Something like that. It's more like to make it super obvious what's happening mm. here, but it doesn't make so much sense because hex length is copy and not move, so you can just use it anyway. It's not that this, this would prevent the code here from using hex length, you know? Um, yeah. It's like, but I thought about this too, like, because in if it would be move, I would probably do it more like this. Um, or maybe just like that. Yeah, anyway, it's probably a matter of shifting tastes or whatnot, and maybe tomorrow it will look different For again. Sure. So now we would be in the spot where we could actually use this. Oh yeah, last thing, by the way, I also realized later that, you know, this try from ID, it makes sense in the sense of, you know, try from is very common to see in Rust and it does the right thing. It returns a result. It was from ID before in the times when it didn't return a result. So all that makes sense. However, it's the only thing that constructs the prefix. And then I realized, yeah, it's a kind of a bit of a complicated way oh, of writing this. Because if there's one default way of creating an object, then it's typically called new. And that's it. And that's how you create the object. And in many places in good oxide, you see that I somehow avoid that. So once there is blob ref from bytes, for instance, right? This could also be new. Like this is the only thing that creates a blob ref. But the new kind of, I don't know why, but the new implies, especially in comparison to the from, that there is some data expected. The new kind of just does its thing, even without an input maybe, the from, always says it takes something and then constructs something from it. 
but again that's probably taste or i don't know <laughs> it's the thing is both is kind of right this is why i think you know i i just want to say this is kind of prevalent this could and maybe should be new and mm. i'm considering to rename this everywhere to be honest uh, because this is kind of consistent uh because having new as a name is even more prevalent in rust i think than having these self-made from ish constructors because it's not really try from because try from is hard or let's say impossible to do with multiple parameters you know you could pass a tuple of two things but then it's kind of you know try from is kind of cumbersome unless it's a single thing that we want to use so this is why we have our custom try from in the first place to have two parameters but that's in fact just new and i just have to remind myself when to use new uh, and when to use these try from thingies because my my explanation right now is that maybe if there's just one way of doing things call it new and maybe while you are not so sure about what you're doing there call it from something more specific because as an api i like it it reads better from bytes and then you pass some bytes um mm -hmm. but as things but also you you can't do what's it called overloading a function right that kind of expects different parameters so you're kind of forced to rename it anyway yes. and then this would make sense new for only one way and then from for multiple ways yes um but then you know it, so by that rule i guess once you know there's only one way you call it new but then if you add another way what do you call it <laughs> from something else and then new then then you have kind of this discrepancy between new that is not descriptive it doesn't say from what it wants mm -hmm. to create this so from a let the api grow perspective from something seems to be more cons you know more future proof mm -hmm. um but then again we kind of know that i mean do we know that's the thing i don't know it's it's a small tiny thing to i don't you know to to discuss for hours i suppose maybe there is some outcome then but that's the kind of things i think about by now so it's maybe kind of the fine adjustments already for mm. the api design and maybe one day i figure it all out if you look at the standard library news used a lot um and there's also conversions from using try from or from but then it's the traits that are used and not your own kind of methods like I do. So having something mm -hmm. like this is less common, uh, I, I feel. Um, but also not unheard of. So yeah, stuff. Yeah, hard to say if you have yeah. to wait for a specific case to kind of make that decision or if you just implement something now yeah. with the risk of then having to change it again later. Yes. Um, I'll keep this of course it's out of scope this refactoring and there's no clear answer yet but here i feel confident that this is the only thing that will ever exist for this so let's call it new it's also simpler than uh, shorter it's kind of neater you know look at this it's better than try from blue blah blue blah 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 try from object id and hex length if you want to go all in you know we even we already shortened the id try from id but you also need a hex length uh, so what uh uh, Swift and Objective C, they have their own ways of dealing with this, and they kind of provide an idiomatic way of doing all these things um, in a very verbose and clear way, form as well. Uh, in Rust, you're a bit on your own, just with normal methods. Okay, uh, let's compile that. I think this was in hash. Hash should still work. Yeah, and as always. I do have to regroup these, dock this one, and dock this one. Okay, everything works. And the, ne the next step would be to look at git pack and see if we can write our first test. Two are ignored. Uh, if I can find them. Please let me jump there. No, it doesn't let me jump there. This works sometimes, I swear. Look up. Prefix. Okay. And I ignored it because right now it's actually failing. Okay, 
So that looks like fun. There's an empty method with a to do. And now comes the, you know, it's actually, I don't think it's that hard. We already talked about it. But before we go there, all that work, I think we can do a little site tracking thing here because it's important to share for those who are still here, they will definitely get something worth their while. Some super interesting knowledge. So git and path. Uh, throughout the code base, you would find things like this where you have a binary uh, or b string and you just call two path on it and that can fail and then is really the question like what would git do does git actually fail is like why can this even fail and what would git do and how do you you know there was never a full understanding from my side how git deals with path um there was dangerous half knowledge and kind of assumptions that I didn't really double check. And that's also dangerous. And I realized that this gets broader and broader and I just had to stop and unify the handling of path so that ideally the same set of methods are dealing with this typical stuff that is always there so that it's, you know, later to ch later more easily changeable and that it's also more clearly expressed what you're doing with this path and why it is what you're doing that because more documentation, more of everything, instead of just a two path question mark, you know, this doesn't really tell you much. And uh, so this came into play here, this unify path encoding ticket, which was mainly research. And I just tried to start by understanding how Git does it. And Git, you know, path and Git, where do they come from and where do they end up in? I mean, where they end up in is probably less interesting because it's clear that Git only stores path as bytes and it doesn't care about what these bytes are or how they are encoded even. It just assumes that it can find slashes in it sometimes to do path separation uh, or component separation, something like that. This is what it assumes. Um, so some encoding that is ASCII compatible is assumed, obviously, because think about it, if you have code that is like, uh, here's my path, and this is foobar, and if you now search for a slash in there, like, you do it like this, but why does this work? Why would that even work? Because by all means, this is just a byte and a byte, you know, just some number. And why do you think this has the right number to compare to? Like, why does this match? And that's already, you know, the answer is there's some encoding present. Something says that this matches this and it's just mm. working. And it's not obvious, right? But it's, it's, something you assume and the git code assumes that everywhere. And so once Unix path, but that's pretty much it because everything between these slashes is free for all. Do what you want. Shouldn't be, there should no be, be no null in there either because of C's null delimited strings. So now we have kind of two encodings layered on each other. We have the implicit encoding of C strings, which says null is special. And we have this assumption that a slash is essentially ASCII encoded, if you want to compare it, if you want to find it in that string. Okay, and this is just because it's C, uh, because they wrote it in C, right? This is why they just made it like this. And many other C programs have been written like this before. And that's just it. C dictates that nobody thinks about this anymore in a world of, yes, um, a lot of languages. But C essentially was born in, in an English speaking country and it's still that. And the basic encoding that is assumed is that and Git is that. Okay, so some encoding is there, but how does it deal with Windows? How does it deal, I mean, Windows, why is Windows special again? Um, and you will see that 
the reason that Windows exists is the reason we actually have this conversation at all. Like, thanks you, Windows. Again, the spoiler alert. So that's, you know, TLDR, Windows did it again. <laughs> um, but it was very inter a very interesting read for sure. Uh, let's get into it because that's just a preamble essentially. So where does do path end up in? They end up as a bunch of bytes in all kinds of places on disk. Um, but that's, you know, these two layers of encoding, they're present, but is there more encoding present? Like what's with the in-between bits? How are they encoded? Um, I don't know. And why is this necessary? So here we go. Uh, how do I go about this? Yeah, let's actually take a look at a few pieces of code. Let's see, the dear end. Okay, so this is here in Win32. So that's some compatibility code that helps Git to work on Windows. And when it opens a directory, then it takes some name, some directory name that is encoded in, well, our two layer encoding plus some unknown encoding. And it converts this to X, UTF to WCS path. So whatever that is, across maybe maybe it's transform or something, transfer, transform, UTF. Okay, so UTF encoded stuff apparently to white characters. Maybe that's really just a guess white characters. So convert name to UTF-16. And yeah, we all know UTF-8, kind of. I mean, we think we know. Uh, we kind of think we know Unicode. And then there's UTF-16 that is used on Windows everywhere. So there are APIs, if you want to use them, your strings must be UTF-16 encoded. And this function seems to be doing it. And here's some error handling even. So if that conversion fails for some reason, smaller than zero, look, isn't it just beautiful? Assign the return value to length and then compare length to see if it's smaller than zero. So we have mutation and I mean, oh, the, the waste is kind of, yeah. Like the reason you have crazy bugs is this. But then you just are a bad programmer, right? Yes, of course, that's why. It's true in a way. I mean, programming is not for everyone, if you see. So, and that's that interesting portion. So apparently there's some, so for Windows, they do some re-encoding there and they do this all the time. So now look at this, we open the directory and then find first file, blah, 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 find data. So initialize the deer structure and copy the first deer entry. So that's also interesting. Is this find data to dear entry? So find data to dear entry is literally a conversion from what Windows gives you to what Git wants. And here they convert UTF-16 back to, oh, UTF-8. So on Windows and only on Windows, these strings are expected to be UTF-8 because now they end up in a place where Git actually sees them. Mm -hmm. And that's the first answer to the question. Um, how Git encodes things, but that's only for Windows. So on Windows, the names and path that Git sees, they are UTF-8 encoded. And I did follow this around and ask myself, okay, what happens with OpenDeer on Linux? or non-Windows, it's really just Windows and non-Windows. And there you see that OpenDeer is really just a standard C, libc function that exists pretty much everywhere. And if you dig in further, you find read deer and then you see what it returns. The first entry of a read deer stream is really just a null terminated file name. 
And that's a bunch of characters and that's all you know. No encoding. No encoding. And it doesn't even mention encoding here. Like this is like like this is unthinkable to me. Like wow. They don't mention ownership. They don't mention anything. It's more like, okay, it's there, you work with it, it's cool, don't think about it. Uh, I guess they don't mention ownership because at least they say that it's thread safe the thing. Oh no, wait, it's not. So read deer is not thread safe, so each open handle can only be read on a single thread. That's fair enough. So they usually mention in some way some sort of ownership semantics by giving you this. But anyway, I digress. Um, no encoding. Okay. And that's that's already it. On Linux or Unix, on non-Windows, there's no encoding. On Windows, there's this. So convert, the cross is probably convert, white characters to UTF. So kind of the opposite of here. That makes sense. I mean, we go from UTF-16 that we got from the Windows API to UTF-8. And as opposed to down here, we don't check for errors because these things actually return the amount of bytes copied or something. And that value is negative on error. But here they do not care about that conversion, which kind of implies that it can never fail. It's infallible, even though it's not. Yes, <laughs> so, yes this means that if this fails, then what would happen? We have that entry here with some directory name. It expects to be written with a file name, but it's not actually being written. And you can only hope that this data is initialized with something useful so that it's not garbage that it will then read but it's it's something valid and i don't know if that's going to be the case because yeah i don't know where it sets the length of the string you know like how does it know that the string like how long is the string going to be how do they know the length of the created string I don't know. So maybe that, that creates a zero. Ah, probably that creates a null terminated string. So this one has a null somewhere. So this is how they know where the string ends. Okay, fair enough. And probably that's pre allocated. It's, um, it's probably like that dear end structure that we saw in the libc, where it's essentially just an array of bytes up to 256 or something yeah and if you read <clears throat> if you read the instructions of the libc manual there on how to understand how much space you have in d name then they also say that i think this is something you can't do reliably that's not platform independent there's some implementations out there that do it differently so you can't actually understand what's the maximum size of that field because it's not necessarily uh, a flat array of 256 bytes in a structure. So that this, you know, every, every when you actually read this, you know, people say, C is platform independent, the only true thing that you can use to write everywhere, you know, but it's not actually true because there are all these little differences that prevent you from being platform independent. And it's just, you know, a lie you tell yourself to sleep better or something. But yeah, not not true. And that's breaking somewhere. And Git runs on many platforms, right? So I'd say it's pretty good. But also what I read kind of made me doubt that this actually works everywhere. But who knows, you know? Maybe nobody has these machines anymore. It doesn't work, but not unified. So so that that's already, I think that's a bug here. That's a potential bug if that fails. But maybe it's infallible, right? But if it's infallible, yeah, why do we have this potentially? Something might be going on there. Okay, so to sum it up, because we have windows, these bunch of bytes need to be converted to be used to, UT, uh, to UTF-16. And that conversion, I don't know, 
Can it fail from UTF-8 to UTF-16? Actually, that's infallible. But from UTF-16 to UTF-8, it can fail. Git doesn't seem to think that, but Rust thinks that. So this is a binary string, by the way, here. So that's just a bunch of bytes. And we say, hey, give us a path. But a path then, uh, an operating system path, like one of these, that's now something that can be passed to the operating system because it's a, in a correct encoding. Um, and the encoding actually is not necessarily specified. It differs by the platform. So you can't, your code can't assume a coding, encoding here. And you can, you only have limited access to what you can do with the path for that reason. You can't just say, hey, give me the fifth character. No, 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 you don't know the encoding. Uh, mm -hmm. You can work with path separators and so on, but this is an API specific to path. It's there for, for that reason that you can do something with that thing. And then they deal with the encoding under the hood because they know it. They can know it. Okay. So this bunch of bytes is converted to something that the operating system can use. So that would be a UTF, as a potentially UTF-8 to UTF-16 conversion could potentially fail. But also, if you think in terms of where does the original data come from, then you know it will always come from something that is either passed on the command line or it's given to you while you traverse the directory of on disk. So this is where this encoding comes into your program, basically. Mm -hmm. And ideally it stays on your, it, it stays, you know, it stays with you. Ideally that encoding doesn't leak to some other computers or platforms, but effectively it does. Because once Git has transformed the UTF-16 bytes it gets from Windows to UTF-8, then it's UTF-8. And then this UTF-8 stuff is written into the index, it's written into trees, it's written into objects. And these are being pushed to a server and then you clone it on Linux and then you've got UTF-8 encoded bytes. Fortunately, Linux really doesn't care about the encoding as long as there is an ASCII slash and no null. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the baseline. And that's actually a property of UTF-8. UTF-8 is full ASCII compatible, right? This is why it's so useful. And this is why it even works. And on Linux, UTF-8 can just be, you know, created as a bunch of bytes and the file system doesn't care what these bytes represent. It really doesn't care. It doesn't have to. It's just a unique set of bytes and they're your file. Boom. This also means that technically, if you have um, if you have special characters, you know, Chinese or Japanese, where actually the same character can be represented differently in Unicode, which is possible, then all of a sudden you can have two files which look perfectly the same on a file system that is not Unicode aware. Mm -hmm. So fun stuff that you get, right? And uh, so it would be possible to create these on Linux and check them into a repository. And then on, uh, for example, macOS, which might be Unicode away, I don't know. Um, you check it out and then you have a duplicate file there. Uh, I mean, you have a file that already exists, um, which is called case folding or folding generally, that something is folded into one, two things are folded into one. And Git knows about that. Git does not assume uh, you know, it doesn't try to understand case sensitive or case insensitive. It just says, if I try to check something out and something else is already there, that is not that, um, something must be wrong. And then it kind of detects these conflicts and can list them. Um, and mm -hmm. that's also one of one thing that can go wrong because of how file systems work and whether or not they're actually Unicode aware and so on. But Git itself doesn't care and doesn't have to just happily transfers these strings back and forth and doesn't even try to understand them, except for the basic baseline encoding. Um, okay, so that's interesting. Now we know where they come from. Linux doesn't care. So where is like where does the question mark come from? What's the issue here? Ah, <sighs> so UTF. 8 to UTF-16 is a con conversion that always works. 
and UTF-16 to UTF-8 is a conversion that actually doesn't always work. Uh, let's see how this works on Windows. So on Windows, and here comes the fun. So look at this. This function here, this fantastic X blah, blah, blah. So the there's UTF-16 to UTF-8. If you look at the implementation, then you see it calls this Windows function here. And this one actually tells you um, tells you about the security considerations and the issues and bugs that have been found and fixed over the years in Windows. Um, Windows Vista and later. Because initially, before Windows Vista, it would not correctly transform UTF-16 to UTF-8. And that causes ill-formed UTF-8. Back then, it was, would actually be infallible if your output would match. Like if you have enough space in the destination array, you would always have a valid conversion. Um, fine. And Git was apparently very sure that this is the case because Git doesn't even check errors as we know. So, and I don't know, Windows Vista release date, when was that? Um, some time ago, I guess. Some time ago. Okay. So, you know, the respective code in Git, I don't know whether it was written like the, uh, there or at this time or not, was made 10 years ago. <coughs> so that line here was changed 10 years ago. And who knows, maybe it's just a rename or some somebody touched it for different reason. But definitely Windows Vista time, which was done yeah, 15 years ago. Okay. Uh, but back then they already should have known that this can fail on Windows Vista at least, but apparently, I don't know. So maybe that is even older. And now the now we know why it can fail. Um, not why it can fail, but we know it can fail. And this is where the question mark is coming from. So once we get something from the operating system and try to convert that back to a path, potentially that fails because then it's supposed to be Oh no, wait. Ah, a non Unix system, it needs, it needs to be able to um, convert UTF-8 into a valid OS string. And this OS string has this operating system encoding, which is UTF-16 even though that's even more complicated because Rust doesn't actually use UTF-16. Uh, it uses WTF-8. Like, I always think, what the fuck, 8? <laughs> but it's the wobbly transcoding um, format or something. You see, it's a rabbit hole, but we're nearly, we are nearly at, the, at the end of it. I just don't know if I'm making any sense anymore or I'm coherent with this, but... We're getting there. So far? So. so far, it's kind of wobbly enough. Okay. So when you convert UTF-16 to UTF-8, there is this thing about surrogate pairs that can go wrong. And I didn't really under, I didn't find much documentation on what this really is and why it can go wrong and why it's an issue that was discovered only later. Like, what's the history of this whole mess that Unicode seems to have gotten itself into? And then I found the Rust implementation of uh, the OS string on Windows. And that actually uses an encoding that is not UTF-16, which is two bytes per characters. UTF-16 is two bytes per Unicode scalar, so can represent 65,500 two 
to the power of 16 cases, uh, which is cool, which was cool initially when Unicode only had less than 65,000 code points. So UTF-16 was something that was created before UTF-8 existed. And it looked like the thing that will work forever, right? Like you will never need more than 65,000 code points to represent all the possible alphabets in the whole world, right? Right? And emojis, right? And skin colors, right? <laughs> and modifiers and ligatures and upper lower and pff, yeah okay there we go so it didn't quite work out to be enough for the whole world who would have thought i mean it's a bit like bill gates saying who needs more than 640k of memory right <laughs> it's it's a bit like that and yeah honestly i would have i you know i would have agreed but they were wrong. So what happened is that eventually more and more code point code points were needed and an extension was required. So Unicode was extended to more than a million code points. And these don't fit naturally anymore into um, that encoding. Like these Unicode code points, they don't work for UTF-16. What do you do? How do you squeeze that in? So they made something up that is so-called surrogate pairs. They took a range of thousand of 2048 um, characters out of the Unicode alphabet, Unicode code points, and they just said, okay, we are never gonna use them. So they basically said 65,536 minus 2048 is what's usable in that basic plane how's it called basic multilingual plane that was the initial unicode with 65k and they subtracted these um where are they yeah they, they subtracted these 2048 which is the circuit circuit code points which only exist to be able to extend utf-16 and the way this works is like let's see 1024 times 1024 is more than a million new combinations that come from that. And you can see why it's a pair. It's a bit like a namespace, uh, I think, because that kind of makes sense the way they, you know, with the numbers and so on. So if we see these code points as, you know, let's, let's, say, let's say the first thousand are these surrogate pairs. So if in, in a Unicode encoded string, we see zero and then zero, then we know because the um, surrogate pairs, we know they have a range from zero to 1024. And I just make this up to make it simpler. And then we can just watch out for that. Uh, and I think also, wait, I think they even, um, I mean, this 2048, right? So there's another range of, let's say, 25 till 2048. And now we can watch out for special combinations of characters, which are unique. They can't be, they can't otherwise be represented. So if I see the zero, and if the next one would be at 1025, then I've successfully elevated myself to the yeah, plane zero that has another 1048 potential combinations, right? Or th potential characters. And I can go to plane one and can have this one again, but now it's a different character. So you see how these sum up to be more than a million additional combinations. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's cool because now they said never use these surrogate pairs because they are only supposed to come in pairs and they will encode something else and don't use them. These will never be actual Unicode characters because they are special now. They took them out of the rotation, so to say. They took them out and said they were never going to use them. However, Meanwhile, 16-bit based systems had little to no incentive to do anything about surrogates. 
For several years, Unicode did not assign any character to supplementary code points, and then, until Emoji, only comparatively rare characters. So that's a bit strange because Unicode said they don't use that, these code points, because they're special. But then apparently they managed to assign to these code points nonetheless rare characters, which technically they can do. Because if they don't come into these special pairs, they can just encode a normal character, right? Mm -hmm. This is why they did it, so that they... This is why they have to come in pairs, so that you can still use these unpaired ones separately, but in pairs, they're special. They mean something else. Mm -hmm. I think. Uh, it's my guess. It really is my is my guess, because otherwise they, they couldn't possibly have put some relatively rare emojis there, but they did. So I think this is why, because they were technically allowed to do that. Additionally, the Unicode standard does not require conforming implementations to maintain well-formedness of UTF-16 strings. So UTF-16 was really fine to be ill-formed if it contains unpaired surrogate 16-bit 16 code, 16 code points. So this means that what I just said with, yeah, maybe they did assign some special emojis to these surrogate code points, and they apparently did. Um, but later they said, this is now ill-formed, this is bad. This can't be, they must be, this is never a valid character, these things by themselves, and they must be paired, right? So now we have some constraints in UTF-16 that was never there before and that apparently they didn't care much for years. All right, so now we have old systems, Windows systems, by the way, only Windows systems, but also JavaScript, um, which does the same thing. It uses UTF-16 inside. So strings are two bytes per character in JavaScript and the whole of Windows. So these big worlds, basically, they use this way of encoding and they never enforced well-formed UTF-16 strings, but also it was never required to be well-formed by the standard because if the standard would require that, then all of a sudden, you know, what do you do? Like, um, you have to kind of fix it, but you can't. It's, I don't know. It mm -hmm. makes sense that they couldn't re retroactively declare that bad. Uh, so you just have to live with it. But that's a major issue there. It's a kind of a, a bug that managed to slide into something as big as Unicode that affects only UTF-16 as encoding. It's not even Unicode, but think about it, that the encoding of Unicode somehow affects Unicode because the encoding is already so bad that they never assumed it might be more than 65,000 characters, right? Like, and then this encoding to make it work, UTF-16, they had to adjust the actual standard of Unicode to make that possible by declaring these special surrogate mm -hmm. pairs, which then created their own slew of follow-up problems because now you had to declare previously valid strings invalid, and now you have this ill-formedness possibility only if you go from UTF-16 to UTF-8, essentially, or to some other representations, because you're not supposed to um, make them, make these surrogates representable because they're an encoding, encoding detail. They're not part of Unicode for that matter. And it was discovered that these early pre-Vista encoders from UTF-16 to UTF-8, they would actually create this ill-formed UTF-8 that can be used to hide um, to hide special characters. So this way you can hide slashes, you can hide dot or dot dot in path mm -hmm. from parsers who might want to prohibit you from stepping out of your directory or something, you know? Like I give you a path to break out of a sandbox and you try to find these dot dot thingies in the string, but I have hidden it using this ill-formed UTF-8 that you don't even know exists and I break out. And this, is, and this was used for actual security uh, exploits or for actual mm -hmm. exploits. Incredible, right? Like who would have thought? Yeah. Okay. So they fixed it, and now uh, converting these ill-formed UTF-16 things with unpaired lone surrogate, surrogate characters 
to utf8 is is invalid and this is where that question mark comes from and that's a very very interesting story and really it's only an issue on windows uh, ever because you because yeah linux doesn't care and that's the smart thing to do i suppose uh except for it does right like with the ascii thing and utf8 like if you throw something that is not kind of at least a slash where it's supposed to be, like if you throw that at Git, Git will not work at all. Um, but I assume that for one, these old encodings that are pre Unicode, they don't really, they're not really used anymore. And that even they were smart enough to kind of keep these basic characters in their spot, let's say, right? Before just struggling it all around and breaking everything. Um, like, I, th I think for another episode, we can look at why do Japanese paths have percent characters in them? Yeah. I am Japanese path windows have percent maybe like this. Is this better? No. But anyway, uh, let's not digress too much. But on, in Japan, you have something like C colon, hmm. and then some Japanese stuff. So that's the path separator there. And there's also some story behind it, I guess. But I don't know the story, by the way. But now that I learned a bit more about encoding, I can imagine it's related to this. Maybe it's just a backslash, but in that encoding table that they have been using, it's this maybe, I don't know, it just displayed differently, maybe. But fun stuff. And what uh, this WTF8 does is it takes WTF, uh, sorry, it takes UTF16 encoded strings, which may be ill-formed, and it converts them to UTF8 but maintains that ill-formedness so you can round trip it. So converting UTF-16 to UTF-8 and back to UTF-16 is lossless. Mm -hmm. But this also means this encoding is an implementation detail. It must never touch disk, it's transient. It's really just for internal storage. And this is the encoding that powers OS strings in Rust. And path are just OS strings in disguise. Um, just a wrapper the path is for that. And Rust does this to, um, you know, not have different memory characteristics on Windows where otherwise it would need twice as much storage for strings. And that's a nice thing to do at the cost of CPU, but you know, trade-offs. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's something I'd want. I'd rather have more memory, let's say, and you know, CPUs are fast, getting faster. So I understand that it's good, it's great, but super interesting um, however if you transform from wtf8 which we can regard as utf16 that may be ill-formed what kind of stuff i'm saying but i think it makes sense you can treat this as utf16 that may be ill-formed if you transform yeah. this to utf8 then this might not work because the ill-formedness might be there unpaired surrogates mm -hmm. and this is why the whole conversion stuff can fail but only because it can fail on windows because of that exact thing and that's it it's that and only that will never happen on linux this code path is infallible on linux or unix or non-windows and that was really interesting to find out so that also means, I mean, that's just something you have to live with here, right? I mean, there's no way around it. Um, you said, or is there a different way that you can encode this? Good, right. What's the conclusion for good oxide? Um, yeah, for good oxide, let's stash this. And go to main because it just merged the changes here. Forget oxide, it now looks like that. So I unified all the x all the path related handling when it comes to conversions from a bunch of bytes to OS strings or path and back 
I unified this and put it into a common spot. In my case, just Git Features Path because Git Features kind of this crate that everybody can pull in. And you have all these little utility functions that are the sum of all the path manipulations that were used throughout the code base so far. And they convert from an operating system path to bytes or from bytes back to a path and they handle errors similar to what you've seen with the question mark, like same thing essentially. So that does not try to fix this. It really just puts the code. It does, it, it does it internally. It kind of, kind of, it just built an abstraction around it. So it's easier to handle in different Gilox type crates. Yeah, it's unified because now it's used, mm -hmm. the, all the crates use the same code path and it's mainly a thing of docu documentation because everything you saw on that ticket, I just copied it here as my little <laughs> story for, uh, you know, boring evenings or something, which kind of should help you to understand why it is what it is and why Git Oxide does what it does along with the research that was conducted into Git itself, which I don't think does it correctly actually. Like Git will have some weird behavior if you throw these, if you throw that question mark at it. It will not even panic, it will not crash, it will just do weird stuff, I suppose. Uh, so Git Oxide can be better and already is better because it sometimes, like here, it bails out, right? So it uses a fallible function and just an option path returned here. And it converts this into an error and says, it's ill for MTUTF8 because now we know exactly what that is then. And we just mentioned the original thing, which we convert into a B string. I mean, that original is a B string. And it's a bunch of bytes, which are, how are they encoded? They are UTF-8. Uh, what, what, what's the encoding of these? Well, they are possibly UTF-8 encoded. Maybe Git itself wrote that string and it wrote ill-formed UTF-8. Maybe because it, you know, maybe because it's still there. I don't know. So there is some index with some ill-formed UTF-8 in there. Maybe somebody wrote that somewhere 10 years ago. And we can't handle that anymore. We can't use that. It's not valid. We can't convert that to a path because it will see these ill-formed things in there. I think it will detect that when converting. And we just bail out. Um, and many places do bail out. There are some places which call the sibling function that is called yada, 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 or panic on Windows, just to be clear that this really is an issue only on Windows. Mm -hmm. um, because on Linux, there is no encoding needed. Like there is no actually, not no UTF-8 stuff going on on Windows. You just say here, there's a bunch of bytes make them into an OS string, make them into a path and it will work because no encoding required. Um, and that's, that's it right now. You know, this is a safe basis for me because now if you ever wanted to look in who is panicking, then you can, you know, you can find this and see if you want to change this. Like you basically would have to track down where this path is coming from that might be having ill for, like a path that's already coming from the operating system. We know that, but who is passing this? You know, is this can this be the user? In our case, it's always some API user because it's our crate crates. And mm -hmm. yeah, here we can panic. And if this is a problem, some for some, maybe it is. Then this can be fixed by making this fallible here and returning a result instead, and then bubbling this up can be. And this is how I see it. Like if it happens, it can be fixed. And do you have a test for that action? Like actually having these ill formed UTF strings or is it mo mostly the type system that you, that you trust on here? Uh, you can just trust the type system and you trust, or I trust the existing conversions that they're able to detect these mm -hmm. ill formed things. Um, because of course I trust it, um, no other way. Um, you can of course test it yourself because if you look at the <clears throat> documentation for OS string 
I think OS string X, then then you see examples here that contain that may sometimes be malformed. Um, mm -hmm. I think here this is valid. I think I saw it for char. Safari, it keeps reloading pages that have been loaded a long time ago and it's related to having tab groups and it's very broken and I'm very disappointed that they can't get this right. But there is an example here. If I could find it quickly. Decode UTF-16, is this the example? Yes. Here, so it can even detect unpaired surrogates because it just knows, mm -hmm. ah, I saw something in that range and the next one is not the pair, so it's unpaired. And yeah. it's just that. And this is how, yeah, it's all, it's pervasive throughout the standard library and it could be so much simpler. Like think about it. OS strings as an abstractions, maybe they wouldn't even exist, something like that. Maybe we could just assume UTF-8 everywhere. But yeah, it's okay. In 20 years, the Rust successor comes along and that one might be able to just ditch the old stuff and say, everything is Unicode, it works, forget UTF-16. Nobody uses that anymore. So yeah, but for us, we still have to learn about these mistakes of the past and deal with it every time we write software that has to run on Windows or deal with something that is on Windows. Yeah, so that's the two worlds. That's how Git Oxide does it. And ultimately, it probably never runs into this, but every time you deal with path, you have to think about encoding, you have to think about what's stored on disk and do you, use to, do, you do it correctly? And most of the time the answer is yes, I think. And from there, yeah, you'll we'll just see if something comes up. The preference, of mm. course, is that good oxide bubbles these arrows up and does not panic. But in some places, yeah, I guess it's okay to panic, but it's not, it's just two places ultimately that panic. And that can be fixed relatively easily, I think, if necessary. Yeah, if somebody still has these files. Yeah, so that's the story. Jeez. And now. Pretty amazing, yeah. <laughs> How deep these rabbit holes sometimes go. <laughs> yeah, have to. I, I mean, it's great. Now I finally understand this for the first time. Uh, for sure, for the first time, of course, but I didn't really expect that. I didn't really expect Windows to be responsible for it again. Uh, like you thought, only dealing with backslashes and slashes is cumbersome and annoying, and it totally is. I really don't. It's like, ah, oh, this again. Whenever I deal with paths, it's like, oh, really? Um, but now there's one more thing on the list that we have to thank Windows for, and I have a feeling it's not going to be the last one. So maybe that's a, ni that's a nice word. Oh, I forgot to put the video on the screen again. So now for the first time, oh. our faces. Yay, hello. <laughs> that's already the end. <laughs> and um, because it's already 60 minutes in. It's a good conclusion. Thank you, Windows, for all the fun things that you give. And see you next time. Thank you very much. <laughs>